So today we're looking at the person and the purpose of the Holy Spirit. And uh, what, what I want to try to do in this lesson is to give a, a balanced understanding of what the purpose of the Holy Spirit is. Because I believe many times there is extreme sides in the Protestant movement and the Holy Spirit gets very misunderstood. So let's look at the purpose and the plan and the person of the Holy Spirit today. Okay? All right. So the group of people, there is a group of people, I was doing a little study on this, there is a group of people who believe that the power or the move of the Holy Spirit, the acts of the Holy Spirit, as some people call it, ceased to exist after the New Testament was canonized, after the New Testament was done being written. And those kind of people we refer to as cessationist, people who believe in the cessation of the works of the Holy Spirit. What they try to, what, what the, the basis of their understanding is, if I believe that the Holy Spirit, let's say for example, the gift of revelation. So if I believe the Holy Spirit is still revealing things to a human being, that means that we are adding to what has already been canonized in what we know as the Bible. And so there is no need for that. Because in uh, Revelation, God says, do not add anything to this book, do not take away anything from this book. So if I'm adding to it, I'm actually adding blasphemous uh, doctrine or truth to what's already there. So I don't need the, the revelation, the gift of revelation may not need to happen, or the gift of prophecy or the gift of tongues may not really need to happen. So those people are called the cessationists, or I would maybe you could call them extreme cessationists. And one of the verses that they would use is from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, uh, from verses 8 through 10. And in verse 10 it actually says, Tongues will cease once the perfect one has come. It's, it, it dawned on me that when the perfect, it says here in 1 Corinthians 13, 10, that when the perfect one has come, and I believe that it's talking about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when he comes, when Jesus comes again, then think about it. You won't need the gift of revelation. You won't need the gift of interpretation. You won't need the gift of tongues because we will be with him in eternity in heaven. And so I don't need to understand, I don't, I don't need the gift of healing at that point. But right now here on this earth, there's trials, there's tribulations, there's sickness, there's sorrow. I need the gift of healing. I need the gift of interpretation or understanding something, the word of knowledge or the word of wisdom. So I, so I don't think, I, I mean, I am not a cessationist. So I started looking, so what am I? The opposite of cessationism is continuationism. Now this word is not in the English dictionary. Continuationist is what I would be considered. But there, I found out that there's, there's, because I believe in the continuation of the move of God, a continuation in the move of the Holy Spirit. And so if the Holy Spirit continues to move, there are actually extremes on it. So I, I took the liberty of dividing them into extreme continuationists, and then the other one I call balance continuationists. Let me explain. And extreme continuationism is this. A lot of these people, the, these, the people who fall into this category, they would put their focus or their faith in the power gifts or the gifts of the Holy Spirit, mainly the power gifts or the gifts of signs, you could say, the gift of tongues, the gift of healing, the gift of interpretation, outward expressions of the gifts of God. See, because... That is where they get a kick out of it. And many of these times you, you've gone to these churches or you've seen these people when they go to a service and they don't feel something in their emotion. See, I, the Holy Spirit does connect with your emotion. The Holy Spirit does um, minister emotionally many times to you, to your, to your emotions. But these guys, if they don't feel anything in their emotion, they just, they're done. The service wasn't that great today. I didn't feel the presence of God today. Or if they get emotionally hyped up or they're excited, they fall around, then they're like, oh yeah, today was a great service. We had a great time with God. That I would consider is extreme cessation, uh, continuationism. Mark 16, it talks about those who believe, these are the signs that will follow in my name. Even if you drink something poisonous or you pick up snakes, it will not hurt you, it will not affect you. And this is true, guys. I don't know if uh, this is true. In some parts of southern... Um, Texas, there are people who have picked up, they, they, they do this as a ministry, they pick up poisonous snakes. There's actually YouTube videos on it. There's this one guy, he picks up the snake, he's talking in tongues, and then this poisonous snake bites him. It's all on video, and it, he starts bleeding. It's, it's, see, I, I think that is, that is misusing or abusing the power of God or misunderstanding the scripture. That is not what Jesus meant. 
when he said this, and I believe that these people would come under the extreme continuationism. So then you're saying, okay, dude, what are you then? Bro, what, are you, what do you fall under? I took the liberty of translating it as balanced continuationism. We pursue the gifts of the Spirit, but in a balanced form. You can't just focus on some of the gifts and forget about the others. Amen? A balanced approach, seeking more of the Holy Spirit, where He moves, when He wants to move, where He wants to move, where He likes to move. See, I believe there's an extreme ignorance in the body of Christ today concerning the gifts and the, the, the Holy Spirit in general. Because there's extreme ignorance that leads to controversy, which leads to misunderstanding and abuse. And uh, many people get hurt. I've seen many, many of my friends, they would come to a, a, a church meeting or something and they see uh, the Holy Spirit or the power of the Holy Spirit being abused, being misused, and they don't understand, they don't want anything to do with it, last that's the last time they come to church. I think we need to have a balanced approach to the Holy Spirit, the functioning of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? So let's look at our first um, part for today, the person of the Holy Spirit. I believe that the Holy Spirit is a person, the Trinity. Now the word Trinity doesn't appear in the Bible, so many people say, well, it can't be true. But then the word revival doesn't appear in the Bible, the word second coming or rapture doesn't appear in the Bible. One pastor said the word Bible doesn't appear in the Bible. But we still use it, right? So the Trinity, we don't believe, the word Trinity may not appear in the Bible, but the idea of a triune God, one God, three persons, is present, is constantly present. So as a third person in the Trinity, I believe the Holy Spirit has, as a person, he has personalities. God the Father had his personalities, Jesus Christ had his personalities, and so does the Holy Spirit. Many false teaching have happened in the body of Christ through the years where the Holy Spirit has been projected as a force or an essence or an energy. You know, you, you Google these things on YouTube or something, you find so many different ideas about the Holy Spirit, the misunderstood ideas about the Holy Spirit that is not in the Bible. So I encourage you, even no matter where you hear it or who says it, even if I say it, look for it in the Bible. Ask me. I'm willing to talk to you. Dude, where, where is that in the Bible? Can you please explain it? I want to see. There are many ideas, that videos that I saw where people like, they're great Bible teachers. Some of their stuff is good. But then when it came to the Holy Spirit, they start saying he's like an energy that revives or revitalizes. He's not an energy. It is not an it. He is a he. You know, we, we use the, 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 the word it or for an in, inanimate object. The camera or the tripod or it is an it, a chair. It is an it. But when I'm talking about a person, it is a he, it is a she, the masculine or a feminine gender. And so every time you look in the Bible, whenever it talks about the Holy Spirit, no matter which language you're reading the Bible in, it always has a masculine gender to it. The Holy Spirit, he is not a force. He is not a created being. Some people believe that Father God created Jesus and his force is the Holy Spirit. That is not true either. Jesus and the Holy Spirit are not the same. They're not interchangeable. They're three dif distinct persons, yet one. So let's look at some truths about it, okay? The truth about the Holy Spirit. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1, 1 says. And the earth was formless and without shape. And the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the earth. Now this is the first three verses of the, of the book of the Bible. Uh, these are the first three verses in the Bible. Many of us have read it. Many of us have memorized it. It says, in the beginning, God created the earth. The Hebrew word used for God is Elohim. Elohim is a grammatically plural noun for gods, plural, yet being singular in meaning. So it, in the beginning, gods created the earth, but it also means singular. It's kind of hard to understand, it's kind of hard to comprehend, but it means plural, but it's actually talking about one person. Because the, the, the Shema says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God, but he's three personalities, but he's three persons. That's how it is. And the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the earth. The word hover talks about like a chicken or a bird that would cover its, its chicks, protecting the eggs. The Spirit of God was still protecting and forming, working in the forming process of the unshaped, unfinished earth. 
That's where we see the first trinity. It doesn't say El, which is singular, or el -ah, which is dual. It says Elohim, which is plural, yet single in nature. And in verse 26, it says, God says, let us create man in our own image. It's, who else is there? Let us create man in our image. I believe it's God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit talking. See, many times it's misunderstood that the Holy Spirit is a force because the word used there, the Spirit of God, is the Hebrew word ruach, which means wind or breath. So it could be misunderstood for an energy or a force. Okay? That's amazingly misunderstood. But you cannot have a personal encounter with a force. I cannot have a personal encounter. I cannot have a personal encounter with wind. Right? Sometimes you use the phrase, the wind has a mind of its own. But it's not really the case because we know the wind doesn't have a brain system. It doesn't have nervous system. It doesn't understand. But you can have a conversation with fire. You can have a conversation with water. Oh, water, you're so tasty. I love you. You're so great. I can put you in a bottle, keep it in my pocket. You can't have a conversation with, with force. You can't have a conversation with wind or fire. You can't have a personal relationship with an inanimate force. But you can have a personal relationship with God. Amen? So let's look at some personal characteristics of this personal Holy Spirit. Person of the Holy Spirit. The first one I want to point out is 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10. For to us God revealed them through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. But he has an intellectual capacity to think. A person, a human being, that's why they're set apart from the other animals, from the other creatures, because we have the ability, the sixth sense, to think. And the Holy Spirit has the ability to think. Look at this. He searches all things, the depths of God, and he reveals them to us. He speaks. The next slide. He speaks. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. The Spirit explicitly says that in the latter times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. That's a future prophecy. But look at the beginning part. It says, he speaks. He says that this is going to happen. Acts 13, verse 2. While they were ministering the Lord, to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I had called them. And you may ask, okay, how does the Holy Spirit speak? Many times he speaks to you through the Bible. A scripture jumps out. You may have read that many times before. You may have read that, memorized that as a child. But this, this jumps out and like, huh, that makes more sense. That's a revelation to me today. It's because the Holy Spirit is revealing that to you. He speaks to you. Sometimes he speaks in audible voices. You hear it in your spirit. You see, when, you, when your spirit is tuned to the Spirit of God, it says in Romans 8, 5, when your spirit is, you're thinking like the Spirit of God, like say when, if Jen calls me on the phone, she doesn't have to say, hey, it's me, or hey, I'm your wife. I just know her voice because I, I know who she is. I, and she, same with me when I call her. Not just because we have call already. You just know. And that is how it is with the Holy Spirit. The more you spend time with Him, the more you are closer to somebody, the more you're closer to God, you get to know that it's Him. And the Spirit leads you. He guides you. He, he speaks to you. Personal characteristic. He has feelings. Romans 15 verse 30 says, I urge you, brethren, by the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of the Spirit... The Holy Spirit has love, an emotion that we could share, to strive together with me in your prayers to God for me, the love of the Spirit. He could be grieved. He could be offended. Ephesians 4.30 says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So it's possible to offend the Holy Spirit. See, I can offend you right now by saying things to you or being mean to you. Because you're, you're a person just like me. I could do the same thing with God, the Holy Spirit. I can offend Him. Do not insult the Holy Spirit. Hebrews 10, 29. How much severe punishment do you think He will deserve who has trampled under the foot the Son of God and has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which He was sanctified and has insulted the Spirit of grace? So it's possible to insult the Spirit of God. He is a helper and a counselor, and a comforter. I tell you the truth, Jesus said, it is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper, the comforter, the advocate, a counselor, a strength, a standby, the Amplified Bible says, 
will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. The Holy Spirit is a person. Amen. He has the ability to choose. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11 says, But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing each one individually just as he wills or just as he chooses. He has the choice. So how come this person has the gift of faith and this person has the gift of healing and this person has the gift of tongues? The Holy Spirit decides that. He chooses. Acts 16, 7, when they came to Mysia, they were trying to go to Bithynia and the Spirit of Jesus, look at all the different names for God, right? And the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. Go here, don't go here. Paul writes many times, and being led by the Spirit, we went to Macedonia. Being, being led by the Spirit, I, I wanted to come to you so many times, but the Spirit did not allow me. The Spirit has the ability to choose. We already saw a little bit of this. He could be disrespected. When Ananias, not the same Ananias who prayed for Paul, when Ananias and Sapphira, they sold a piece of land in Acts chapter 5, and they lied to Peter. Peter was just a regular man. But they lied to him. And look at what Peter says in Acts 5.3. Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Not lie to the pastor, not lie to the, the congregation, but you lied to the Holy Spirit. In other words, you could lie to God. You could try to hide. But he knows all things. He searches all things. And you know what happened to this story? Ananias died immediately. The people go bury him. By the time his wife comes, says the exact same lie. <laughs> and Peter says, dude, the people, the, the guys that took you, the husband's body, they're standing at the door. And they'll carry you out as well. Pop, she dies. Don't lie to the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 7, 51. You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting. Or some translations say disobeying the Holy Spirit. You could choose to disobey God. You could choose to disrespect God. God told Jonah, go here, but he said, I'm going there. We know what happened. Choosing to disobey God. You're doing just as what your fathers did. Another personal quality, the last one, of the Holy Spirit. There is a debate out there. I've had, I've had my, some, of, some of our friends ask us, or talk to me about this, say, say, the Holy Spirit cannot be worshipped because he's a spirit. If the Holy Spirit has the same nature and deity of God the Father and God the Son, and in Hebrews uh, 9.14 it says he's an eternal spirit, in Psalm 139 David says he's omnipresent, where can I hide from your presence, O God? Even if I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I go to the highest of heights, you're there. He's omniscient. 1 Corinthians 2, 11, 10 and 11, we read that verse, it says, you know all things. You understand all things. If, he, if the Holy Spirit possesses all the qualities and the nature and the, of the deity of, of God the Father and the Son, I think that qualifies him as God, which means that he deserves my worship. So the Holy Spirit is a person. He has the attributes of a person, he performs the acts of a person. He's to be treated as a personal God and worshipped as God. Amen? So that, that, those are some of the points that I want to talk to you about the person of the Holy Spirit. Look with me for a few minutes about the purpose of the Holy Spirit. Why do I need the Holy Spirit? What is the purpose of the Holy Spirit? In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come on certain individuals for a certain time and they'd be able to do some certain extraordinary supernatural spiritual tasks and then he would leave. Remember uh, Joseph in Genesis, he had the ability to interpret dreams. Even when Pharaoh asked him, I, 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 they tell me that you could tell, interpret dreams. And he says, Lord, I cannot do it, but the Lord will do it. Samson, one of the judges, he had the power of the Holy Spirit come on him and he would be able to pick up gates, push down temples and kill thousands of people with a donkey's jawbone. But then there's a sad verse in, in Judges where it says, Samson did not realize the Spirit had left him. Saul was anointed king. The Spirit came on him, he even prophesied at one point. 
But then the spirit would leave him. The demon spirit would take over. And David would play his harp and he would calm down. David prayed, God, do not take your Holy Spirit away from me. The Holy Spirit in the Old Testament would come and go, come and go. But in the New Testament, Jesus promised his followers that he would send another just like him. A paraclete, the, Hebrew, the Greek word for that is. Just like him. Think, for example, um, let's say I have, I have a Samsung J6 cell phone. Okay, I have a Samsung cell phone. And I tell you, I'm going to give you a phone, another phone, just like this. But then when I give it to you, I give you an iPhone 10. Now, I tell you, this is a smartphone. It's actually a better phone. It's got better cameras and more memory. But it is not the same. And you may say, but you said I'll give you another just like this. In other words, you were said that you will give me another Samsung J6. When Jesus said, I will send you another just like me, it means Jesus was a counselor to them, a guide to them. He was telling them where to go, how to live life for the disciples, right? And he says, I'm leaving now, but I'm going to send somebody just like me who will live in you, a person who will live in you. Sometimes it's hard to understand that. I think, Mel. No. It's hard to understand that. But I will send a spirit who will live in you, who will guide you in all truth. So, see, there's a two-step process. When you get saved, when you are born again, you and I, the Holy Spirit comes to live in us. It's a seal that we receive. Look in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge or down payment of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. Verse 13 says, when you get born again, when you believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord, you are saved. You are born again. And as a seal, as a certificate of acceptance, you get the Holy Spirit. You are sealed in Him who is given as a pledge or a down payment. Let's say you, you, I, I, I want to move into your house and you say, you need to give me a down payment of a certain amount. And I say, okay, man, here's a thousand rupees right now. I'll give this to you as a good faith keeping. Keep this until I get the rest of the cash to you. That's a good faith, the down payment. So the Holy Spirit is given to us as a seal. So when we get born again, this is, when we get born again, when you get saved, you receive the Holy Spirit. Every believer of Jesus Christ has received the Holy Spirit. Now the baptism or the filling of the Holy Spirit is a separate step. It's a separate event. Let's look at that. In Acts chapter 1 verse 5, Jesus said, Wait in Jerusalem till you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Baptism is not a, it's not a hard word to understand. It means immersion or submersion, being fully dunked in or dipped in. So when the Holy Spirit comes, you can say baptism, you can say filling, you can say anointing, you could say submersion, you can say whatever word you want. When the Holy Spirit comes, He will immerse you. He will cover you completely. He will fill you completely. Until that, wait in Jerusalem. See, many times... We talked about this a minute ago. The extreme people on the extreme end, they get focused on the power gifts, on just the gifts. Many, there's a misconception. There's a misconception going around where it says, not just today, it's been going on for years, uh, where it says to be saved, or there's another word, to be fully saved, you need to be able to speak in tongues. Because many times in the New Testament where it said, and the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. So you need to be able to speak in tongues to show that you've been filled with the Holy Spirit. Let me show you from the Bible. Now this is what, remember, we're having a balanced understanding, okay? Let me show you from the Bible that it wasn't always the case. Some people spoke in tongues. Not all of them did. Some people spoke in tongues. Not all of them did. Acts chapter 8. See, we, we cannot put uh, the Holy Spirit in a box. I cannot tell the Holy Spirit, dude, uh, God, you're going to do this now. By the way, I need to speak in tongues. Many times you go to the, some of these churches where they try to teach you to speak in tongues. You can't, you can't do that. You, it's, it's not a language. It's not like French or English. It's not a language. You can't, you can't teach them that. It says that they spoke in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. 
Let, the, let God work in you. Let the Holy Spirit work in you. Acts chapter 8, Philip was preaching in Samaria. And uh, look at verse, uh, verse 5 through 8, right? He was preaching about Christ. Demons were coming out. People were getting delivered. Healing was happening. People were getting saved. And only later on, Peter and John come and they pray and then they receive the Holy Spirit. Verses 14. The Spirit had not come yet. And Peter and John come and say, let's pray for you. They lay hands on them and they pray for them. All this stuff was happening. The healing was happening. The deliverance was happening. Demons were coming out. People were getting saved. All that before anybody were filled with the Holy Spirit. What I'm saying is I'm not, I'm not, I'm not negating, uh, I'm not saying that you don't need the filling of the Holy Spirit. I can't put a formula to it. I'm not going to say you need to be saved first, that you need to be baptized next in the water, and then you will get the filling of the Holy Spirit. I cannot do that. I cannot put that in, in that order. God works the way he wants to work. The Holy Spirit came after Peter and John laid hands on them. And if you read carefully... Nowhere in that passage does it say that anybody spoke in tongues. It says the Holy Spirit came on them and doesn't say nobody, anybody spoke in tongues. The next chapter, Acts 9. Paul, also known as Saul of Tarsus, on the road to Damascus, he's been killing people. He's got a letter, authorized uh, a warrant, saying that he could do these things. He's coming. He sees a vision of Jesus. Other people hear the voice. They don't see Jesus. Paul falls off the horse. He is blind. For three days, Ananias, not the same guy who lied, okay, there's a different Ananias, he comes, lays hands on Paul. In Acts chapter 9, verse 17, you can read all the way to verse 20 if you like. And Paul, uh, when Ananias prayed for Paul, something like scales fell off of his eyes. And Ananias prayed and Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit. Nowhere in that passage does it say Paul spoke in tongues. Well, we could assume that he spoke in tongues. Many times it ends up becoming assumptions. Paul did speak in tongues because later on he says, I speak in tongues. I wish that all, you would all speak in tongues. Which also goes to show that not everybody he was writing to spoke in tongues. I'm not saying tongues is wrong. Please hear me right. I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not disrespecting anybody who's, who has the gift of tongues. God's blessed me with the gift of tongues. I believe it. And you use that in your personal prayer time. You use that to pray to God. You use that to glorify God. Edification. I'm not against it. But what I'm trying to say is if, if God does not give that to somebody, it's okay. Maybe it will come later on. Maybe it won't. That is not a sure sign of salvation. That is, not a, that is one of the many gifts that Holy Spirit gives. That is not the evidence that that person has been filled with the Holy Spirit. Because it says, Jesus said, they will know you by your fruits. In the coming weeks, we're going to look at the fruit of the Spirit. Because they will know you by your fruits. Not by your gifts. Tongues is one of the many gifts. That is not the evidence of the filling of the Holy Spirit. Verse 31 of Acts 9, same chapter. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace, being built up and going, out, uh, going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it continued to increase. Peace, when the spirit of peace, when the spirit of comfort, he's a comforter. He brings peace. These are outcomes or the results of the Holy Spirit. If God gives you the gift of tongues today, praise God for that. If he doesn't give you the gift of tongues, but he's given you the gift of giving, the gift of helps, people who work in the children's ministry or straighten up chairs or run the PowerPoint, that is still a gift. We need all that. We need all that. If every part of my body decided to become an elbow, I would look stranger than I look right now. Amen? We need everybody. Some have different gifts. We're not going to look at the gifts today, okay? We're going to look at that in the coming weeks. So, see, I'm building the sequel, so you guys will come next week. <laughs> All right. I want to look at some of the effects. What is the purpose of the Holy Spirit? Why do I need the filling of the Holy Spirit? Some of the effects or the outcomes once the Holy Spirit fills us. The first thing 
I believe, is conviction. John 16, verse 8, Jesus said, And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. You know that voice in your mind when it says, you know, we should probably quit doing this sinful stuff. We should probably get saved. It's the voice of the Holy Spirit. Even before you get saved, the Holy Spirit is active in you. Before the earth was, while the earth was still shapeless and void, the Spirit of God hovered, protecting, forming like a mother hen. The Spirit convicts us and leads us towards righteousness, towards judgment. That's the first work of the Holy Spirit. So when someone's in their life, when the Holy Spirit is in their life, conviction begins to happen. You know, I need to clean up. I need to talk to the pastor. I need to start reading the Bible. I need to start spending more time in God's presence. The Holy Spirit starts cleaning you up. The Holy Spirit brings understanding. John 14, 26 Jesus said, the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you. He will teach you all things. He will help you understand. You may have read something before and now you're reading and you go, ah, that's what it means. And then you may read it again five days from now and it'll mean something else. Because I don't think anybody could completely understand everything God has to inform us. Our brains are so little. <laughs> Some of ours is at least. But in that, God helps us understand. Amen? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 13. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who was from God. Look at the comparison. Spirit of the world, small s, lowercase s, spirit of God, uppercase s, capital S, right? We received the spirit who is from God that we may know the things freely given to us by God. How do you know the things? Sometimes you don't know God has given you this. Has God given me healing? Is it God's plan for me to be healed? The Spirit will confirm. He will testify. Yes. It says, the Speak not words and thought by human wisdom, but in those thought by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with the spiritual word. That's the job of the Holy Spirit you start getting a better understanding of God's word and God's promises in your life because the Holy Spirit is in you. Amen? He changes our mindset. He renews our mind. Romans 8, 5 uh, through 9 says, For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. So ha, stop right there. So there's two different kinds of thinking. You could think like the flesh or you could think like the spirit. You could get with this or you could get with that. So, if you think like the Spirit, but are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit, for the mind set on the flesh is death. But the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. Peace of God, life, comes because the Holy Spirit fills us. Amen? Look at verse 9. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ... He does not belong to him. The Spirit of God dwells in us. And so we start thinking like he thinks. He changes our mindset. Next point. He brings us freedom. Romans 8, 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus set you free from the law of sin and of death. He sets you free. 2 Corinthians 3.17 now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There's liberty. When the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So if, you, if someone says, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, you see them on Sunday. You see them at one of these revival meetings. You're, they're all hyped up. They're all pumped up. They're all running around, flipping around. But then you see them on Monday. They're like, uh, what happened? You were just filled with the Holy Spirit yesterday. Uh, because it's, it's, it's outward stuff. A lot of times emotional. I, I, I said, the Holy Spirit ministers to our emotions. That is true. That is true. That is true. I've experienced it myself. But it cannot stop there. It needs to be an inward transformation and not just head knowledge. It cannot just be information. It needs to be a transformation from the inside out. The freedom, the liberty comes from the inside. The Holy Spirit promises us eternal life. Again, back to Romans 8. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. There it is again. The spirit of God lives in you. 
who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. In 1 Thessalonians 4, it says, those of us who are dead in Christ will rise first. The rest of us will meet him in the air. He will give life to our mortal bodies. Who dwells in you? It says that again. So if the Spirit lives in you, your whole life gets an upgrade, gets a, a transformation from the inside. Acceptance and adoption. You have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you've received a spirit of adoption. You've received a spirit of freedom. You've received a spirit of peace. You've received a spirit of comfort. You've received a spirit of adoption, acceptance. As sons by which we cry, Abba, Father. We have a Father God in heaven. Amen? So there, the Holy Spirit is connecting us to the Father. And look at this. I like this part where it says, The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. The Spirit himself testifies that we are the children. In other words, he is like a certificate of purchase. A warranty card. When you buy a car, they give you a title. They give you a book that says this car with this VIN number, with this license plate number, belongs to this person, belongs to this guy, and it has your picture, it has your name, it has your thumbprint sometimes, your signature. It, and, and that card, if someone stops you, a cop stops you, or someone says, is, who does this car belong to? You can show that card, this card belongs to me. When you get born again, you get accepted into the kingdom of God, and what is the certificate that says, I belong to God, the Holy Spirit has filled me, is a certificate. The Holy Spirit is a certificate. Empowering. Acts 1 8 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, in your own city. They were in Jerusalem at that time, in your city, in your county, in your state, and then to the remote parts of the world. Samaria was a town they wouldn't go through because they didn't like the Samaritans. Jews and Samaritans didn't get along. But God says, I'm going to give you a power. You've heard this, the power, the word used here is dunamis, dynamite. An explosive power. What is the explosive power to make us effective witnesses of the changed life that the Holy Spirit brings? The purpose and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I believe, is to make us effective in our service and in our testimony. A testimony is not something that you just say. It is something that you live out. Many times I'm guilty of it. I feel so bad because I fall short of, of, of living a, a life that testifies to the changing power of Jesus Christ. A life that lives to the testimony of, that testifies to the power of the Holy Spirit. But then again, I know I feel bad because that's the spirit of conviction. Holy Spirit convicts me. I repent immediately. When the prodigal son had come to his senses, he repented. And God accepted him. Spirit forgave him. Amen. The commission, the great commission as we call it, Jesus said, go, make disciples. That is the commission God has given us. What is the purpose, the primary, the objective, the main objective of the Holy Spirit is that we become effective witnesses to God. One pastor said it like this, sharing verbally and living faithfully. You share with your mouth, but you show it in action. On Sundays or in churches, in revival meetings, it's easy to act full of the Holy Spirit or be filled with the Holy Spirit. But what do we do when we go outside? To live a godly spiritual life from Monday through Saturday or for the rest of your life. You need the filling of the Holy Spirit. So you say, okay, I was filled with the Holy Spirit back 20 years ago, 10 years ago, last week, but now I don't feel like it. Why? Many times we read, even in the, in the book of Acts, Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit. And then it says again, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. Stephen was filled with the Holy Spirit. Many times we use it up, or it leaks, or it evaporates, and you fill it up again. Just like we put a petrol in our car, just because you put petrol in your car when you first started driving it, so, pff, the car doesn't have petrol anymore. <laughs> or you get hungry after you eat breakfast, you're hungry again for lunch and then again for dinner, and a snack in between, a snack before bedtime. You, you need that filling, the filling of the Holy Spirit. 
you need the filling of the Holy Spirit to live an effective life, to live a life that testifies to the life-transforming power of God. I believe that is the purpose of the Holy Spirit. A personal God who Jesus promised will live with you, who will stay with you, inside you. In the coming days, hopefully we'll be able to look at the fruit of the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit as He distributes them. So I encourage you to come, or if you're watching online, check it out. It'll be a blessing to you to have a balanced understanding of what the Holy Spirit's purpose in our life is. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for sending your Son down to this earth. And Jesus, we thank you for dying on the cross and entering into the glory and then sending the Holy Spirit down. Holy Spirit, we thank you for being a constant companion, a friend, for taking residence in earthen vessels like us. God, I pray that we will live a life that is pleasing to you, that is testifying to the power of God. God, as we go through this study, as we go through these coming days, I pray that you'll give us wisdom to understand fully the things of God. Now we agree that we will not be able to understand everything but the things that pertain to our lives, the things that pertain to us maturing in Christ Jesus, that we will produce much fruit. I pray a blessing over everybody watching. I pray a blessing over everybody listening, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here.